Good morning. That's Pastor Bruce, and if you're watching this <clears throat> on video, then you know that I've gotten trapped in Mechanicsville because of all the ice that they predicted. Uh, but I hope that uh, if you were worshiping together, y you can still get the sense of what God is speaking to us this morning. It is February the 14th, gentlemen. It's Valentine's Day. <laughs> And uh, if we see somebody running for the doors to go out and buy something for their wives, you know what's going on. <laughs> uh, today is also Transfiguration Sunday. It is the, the day the church celebrates that event in Jesus' life where he was transfigure, uh, transfigured on the mountain with uh, two of the prophets and uh, God spoke and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Um, this text that we're going to look at today kind of lets me think about the problem with the Kodak moment. For those of you who are old enough, you know what the Kodak moment is. It's that picture you take that makes all the difference. Uh, for those of you who are younger, Kodak was a company that made film and cameras and all that stuff. Um, I've got an excellent camera. Uh, I took photography in college. I uh, even learned how to develop and print my own pictures. Uh, but I don't take a lot of pictures now. My family wonders why I haven't been more of a shutter bug. Um, and I kind of figured out that during the significant events of life, you can miss the moment by trying to preserve it. Uh, you get caught up in, you know, shutter speed, f-stop, uh, framing the picture, uh, making sure you push the right button, make sure you don't jiggle the camera, all the mechanics of taking pictures. And while doing all that, the essence of what is happening, the, the meaning of the moment, uh, can slip by and we miss the experience by trying to put it on film. <clears throat> For me, experiencing what is happening is more important than preserving the moment on film. Because if I experience the moment, it's preserved forever in my heart and mind. If I get a good picture, <clears throat> but I miss the experience, then the moment can lose all of its meaning, though I've gotten a good picture. In today's scripture, Peter has a similar experience at the Transfiguration. We're going to look at this wonderful experience in the life of Jesus and his disciples uh, and how we can apply this uh, experience to our Christian lives. So if you'd like to, turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. And we, we, can, read that, we can read that scripture. Uh, and six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, <clears throat> as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them uh, along with Moses, uh, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and, and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Uh, let us make three tabernacles for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Uh, for he did not know. Uh, what to answer, for uh, they became terrified. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. And all at once uh, they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except for Jesus. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should be should rise from the dead. May God bless the reading of His Word. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus and the disciples have made a, a bold turn in their journey that's eventually going to lead them uh, to Jerusalem and Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. While the mission of following Jesus started out with the promise of faith for the disciples, if you read the first chapter of Mark, you'll see that. But now it's since regressed into a misunderstanding and some fear. 
just who Jesus is and what it means to follow him seems to be ever more fleeting for the disciples to grasp. They've been given a lot of opportunities to see who Jesus is and to hear who he is calling them to be, and yet they're still unsure. Mark's gospel is, is known for its showing the disciples as not getting it. They just don't seem to get it. Uh, and, and here is another example. Uh, the Transfiguration falls into chapters 8, 9, and 10 where Jesus predicts it to his disciples uh, no less than three times in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 about his upcoming suffering and death on the cross and his resurrection. The Transfiguration in the midst of these predictions serves as an important revelation of Jesus' authority <clears throat> both in relationship to the to uh, the tradition of the Hebrews by having Elijah and Moses there and to God <laughs> when he says this is my son this is my beloved son listen to him this story serves as a signal flare for the disciples uh, it should wake their clouded vision and, and yet as the gospel unfolds they continue to misunderstand who Jesus really is and, and where he's really going uh, boy, are we often in the same boat, missing who Jesus really is and what he's really about uh, and what we should be about. Uh, there's a different sermon in my mind, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> uh, this story opens with the common way of Jesus selecting out of the twelve three special companions, Peter, James, and John. Uh, these are Jesus' closest followers, three of the first four that he called from their nets to follow him in chapter 1. They go to a high mountain. That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34. It's on a high mountain that Solomon built the, the, the Jerusalem temple. Biblically, uh, mountains are the, the contemporary equivalent of a, of a direct line to God. The fact that Jesus has taken them up to a mountain should have stirred their anticipation that something was about to happen. Um, but, and they need not wait long because in Mark 9, immediately it reports that Jesus was transfigured before them. In other words, Jesus' uh, body and his clothes were taken up into a, a, a vision-like thing. The, the whiteness of his garments, uh, this vision, this transfiguration blends elements of the resurrection appearance uh, when, the, when they see Jesus lifted up into heaven. Um, it, it, it strikes up images of Old Testament messianic in, uh, imagery with Moses and Elijah being there and representing the, the Old Testament. In this vision, the role of Jesus as Messiah is affirmed through the witness of the divine voice. This is my son, the beloved, my beloved son. Listen to him. Okay, pretty clear. But Peter's response to the vision of Jesus and Moses and Elijah in, in chapter 9 verse 5 is yet yeah, another example of his incomplete understanding of who Jesus is as the Christ. Uh, in, in chapter 8 29, Peter gets the title right he says you are the Messiah but he under, misunderstands the mission and that's a very important distinction that we need to be making all the time we, you know having the titles and having the right doctrine and the right ideas and all that kind of stuff is important but what how does that translate into mission uh, in chapter 9 verse 5 uh, Peter is reverting back maybe to his old identity as a fisherman. Uh, Peter wants to catch the vision and, and, and says, I'm going to build three dwellings, three uh, places, and, and we're just going to remain here on top of the mountain. Bring one, build one for you, Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, the real identity of Jesus as Christ has a goal. And it can't be contained in a shrine or in a 
you know, tent or a church building or anything like that. God has a divine purpose. And at this point, the divine voice speaks to the terror-soaked scene uh, with a command out of the, this cloud, this is my son, he is my beloved son, listen to him. So he, he affirms that Jesus is the son of God, that Jesus is on the right track, he's beloved. And then to us, listen to him. And then as quickly as the vision comes, it, it's vanished. Um, Peter's probably been looking around for sticks or whatever he can do to build these three tabernacles. And as soon as he even turns around to look, the, the whole thing's over. So then on the trip down the mountain, Jesus underscores that his mission to Jerusalem uh, is, is really an essential part of the glory that has been revealed about him on the mountain. Peter, of course, had no camcorder, no digital camera, no handheld microphone, tape recorder to capture the extraordinary moment. Uh, it was literally a mountaintop experience, a once-in-a-lifetime experiences for these three ordinary Joes who, as disciples, were still searching for a clue, and they got it from God himself, and yet I'm not sure that they comprehended it. Peter and, and, and the others were understandably awestruck. Um, all of this was supposed to have been a quiet retreat, a time away from the crowds, and Jesus did this often. But this extraordinary event was unfolding, a moment in history so sacred that Peter, as vice president in charge of doing something, had to do something. Do we know who the vice president in charge of doing something is in our church? <laughs> well, Peter was with the disciples. So he proposed building a booth or a, a shrine, uh, whatever it was that he wanted to do. But he was trying to preserve the moment. Um, we're not told how he was going to do this, whether he had a hammer and saw at the, at the ready. Did he just carry those around? Or was he going to use a few of his fisherman tools, his knife in his belt, to, to put together a, a stick hut? We don't know. Uh, Peter's mind was swirling about uh, how to capture the moment. And, 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 and all the time, this experience of Jesus and, and Moses and Elijah and God speaking through the cloud is happening. And instead of soaking that in, he's wondering how to build a tabernacle. See, that's how we get so sidetracked with, with majoring in minors. Uh, he's wanting to capture the moment instead of letting the moment capture him. Uh, the cloud dimmed uh, the moment before Peter could throw anything together. And, and, and ex except for this voice from the cloud, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. God didn't say, get a selfie of the three of them over there by the cedar tree. <clears throat> he didn't say, be, be sure to capture the moment. Uh, he just said, listen to him. And I hope we're listening to him at this point. Uh, this whole thing is like tourists who see Paris, France, uh, on a journey through their viewfinders uh, and don't really see anything beyond the viewfinder of their camera. They're too busy taking pictures. Uh, <clears throat> Peter wanted to keep this moment from passing and thought uh, it had to be done instead of letting it soak in to him. And, and he's in danger of, of letting the moment pass him. Let's face it, we're, we're too easily distracted in our lives. Our lives are noisy with television, radio, VCR, quad speakers, telephones. Um, you know, I, there, I, there are some people that I think uh, have never had that telephone out of their hand. They must sleep with it. and. Uh, wondering what the, the long term is going to be of that. It's hard to hear the voice of God these days because of so much going on. 
Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to this mountain exactly six days after reminding them those who want to save their lives will lose it and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Mark 8.35 What is it going to profit us to preserve our life's history uh, if we forget the fundamental reason for remembering in the first place? Uh, we ought to call maybe a, a moratorium on all this memory mania and nostalgia that seems to go on sometimes. Uh, yeah, pictures and home movies can jog our memories of family birthday parties and graduations and weddings and so forth. But here's the danger of that. Focusing on the image, we can forget about what the meaning of it was. Uh, we're losing the sense of the sacred in the mundane, the, the putting it together to holding it together with some kind of a picture or something. I, I decided long ago that more weddings were ru ruined by overzealous photographers uh, than by spending more time enjoying the wedding banquet and, and mingling with wedding guests. When I do weddings, I tell photographers that once the wedding ceremony has started, they find one spot and they don't move from there until uh, the, the couple starts walking down the aisle because the last thing I want to do is get flashed in the eyes and can't <laughs> finish the, the wedding ceremony. <laughs> so maybe it's time to throw away the camcorder, the, the, the handheld phone camera, and, and maybe just go look and live for a while uh, to see God in the everyday. To, to and I'm going to make up a word here, I think, to divinize, to, to make divine each moment. To, to listen for the voice of God. Uh, and, and when we're listening uh, and we begin to hear God, don't immediately stop. Try to find pencil and paper and write it down because you may miss the rest of what God's message is to you. <laughs> don't do that because in looking for the pencil and paper, you may miss God's message to you. Uh, listen and, and, and keep listening. God will let you remember later on. Uh, we go through life too busy trying to film or, or make tabernacles at the Transfiguration. Uh, we look, but we don't see. We, we hear, but we don't listen. We, we, we experience, but we don't get the meaning. So what if we've got acid free scrapbooks filled with the ticket stubs and report cards and the press corsages and, and if we've forgotten what made those moments so sacred. Uh, I remember looking at uh, a picture of my daughter uh, at her graduation and it was something extraordinary. It was something that was beyond me. Uh, and. And I remember that day so well. We were standing out on the front porch, and I was so glad that I didn't have the camera that day uh, because I was able to soak that moment in, and it's become a very pleasurable moment in my life. So let's listen to the children. Let's listen and watch life. Let's listen for the sacred. Let's listen for the divine. Uh, let's listen for Jesus. You know, we do that every week and try to remind ourselves that, that Jesus is with us all the time and we take time in worship to, to say when we've seen Jesus in our lives each week. The glory of God's revelation is, in Jesus is seen in the midst of His work to bind up the brokenhearted, to feed the hungry, to care for the sick. And the clue in this passage, not that we've read it, but, but it comes after, but as the disciples and Jesus head down the mountain, uh, they encounter in chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, a father and his epileptic son. We're saying that that's what it was. Uh, the disciples who'd stayed down at the bottom of the mountain had attempted to help them, but, but they had not been able. And so when Jesus shows up, the Father pleads with Jesus to have mercy and to help them. And Jesus responds by calling out the unclean spirit 
uh, and raising the child up. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't say that epilepsy is a part of demon possession. Don't don't hear that. Um, but what was happening with this child was like epileptic fits. Uh, but when Jesus comes, he just makes the child well. And, and you see, we have the contrast of the mountaintop experience and then the healing at the bottom of the mountain. Jesus connects the glory and the power up on top of the mountain uh, with healing broken lives and making them whole at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, the, the glory from the transfiguration uh, can't be contained in a picture or a monument or, or, or set apart like Peter wanted to do. It's, it's, it's rather it's a glory that is supposed to be loose in the world and it seeks out people and places that call for healing, that call for wholeness, that call for restored relationships. Uh, when God reveals His glory to us, it's not just to make us feel good. It's not to set up a, a, a monument to, to remember, but it's to energize us to go down the mountain and minister to the needs of the hurting and the lost. If we have a wonderful worship experience today, will we remember the glory of today's worship by just putting it in a scrapbook or, or, or some notes in your Bible? Or will we let this experience that we had today of God's glory send us out into the world to heal the hurting and to find the lost and to do something with this great sense of what God wants to do in and through us as Jesus lives in us? I hope you've experienced God's glory today. And if you have, I hope that you take it from this place and that we go with it into the world today and not just go home and dissect it or go to the go to eat after the service and, and dissect it and whatever you may do. If you're hurting, if you're sick, if you're if if you don't know which way to turn, remember God is here and He's always willing to hear our prayers and He's here today to heal. So don't leave this place without letting Him do that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have reminded us today to pay attention, to listen to you, and, and to make sure that we don't hurt that listening time with all the distractions that we can have. Let us be more attentive to you in everything that we do. And Father, as we sense your glory like on that mountaintop, maybe in worship today, that we take that glory with us into the world and we show it to those who really need to see you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I hope that we can all get together again soon. <laughs> I hope this weather pattern breaks of every weekend having a, a snow and ice storm. I pray that you be safe on your way home and as you do all the things that you do this week. And uh, I pray that we'll be together again next week. Uh, God bless you. And uh, if you need me, give me a call. Blessings.